It's a great pleasure to be here to uh, share some of the uh, research we have uh, in, at Texas A&M. Uh, my name is Dead Song. Um, all right, so today we, I'm going to, you know, talking about the autonomous vehicle research we've done from perception perspective, mostly so from the sense of fusion perspective. I will take us back uh, 20 years when, we, when I was still just a grad student at UC Berkeley uh, when we um, decide, a student group decide to participate in Double Grand Challenge 2004, um, we, you know, out of uh, innocence, so we trying to use the uh, motorcycle as the platform because we believe it can go off-road and uh, deal with what is um, uh, being required uh, because Double Grand Challenge, just give you a little background, the time was uh, U.S. was involved in Iraq war and the convoy truck was hit, so the DOD trying to, trying to see if anyone come up with a solution to make the vehicle drive by itself to cross the desert terrain. So this is actually the competition course of 2005. Um, the, you have to drive a vehicle over 155 miles. So a group of us, uh, just no faculty involvement, uh, was trying to start a team using the motorcycle. So the, at the beginning, nobody believed this is doable. Uh, so Berkeley does not allow us to use any Berkeley logo or name on this. So, so we, we only call us blue team it's because the color. <laughs> so we were able to pull it off to get the vehicle uh, running and balancing itself and cross some different type of terrains. Of course, perception wise, we actually have very minimum design of perception. And you think about this is a 2004, 2005. The competition power is no more than today's cell phone. Uh, we only use, there's no 3D light at the time, okay? And uh, we only have one onboard camera, the GPS, and uh, a fiber optic gyro or uh, MU uh, on board. That's uh, all we have for navigation purpose that get us started for a uh, sense of fusion project. So in, in fact, um, that project ended in 2007, uh, 2006, actually, I would say, uh, when DAPA moved into its urban challenge, we did not participate at that stage because this is the explicit requirement that you have to have four wheels. So at the same time, I moved to, uh, I already moved to the a and to start my faculty life. So my teammates at Berkeley uh, founded a company called the Berkeley 510 System. The site is secretly acquired by Google. They built two cars, uh, which is shown here, the Google Street View and the Waymo vehicle later on. Um, I'm very proud of our teammates at the time. Um, but at a and uh, I actually start thinking uh, from a minimalist approach, how many sensors, what can you do about it to get a navigation functionality? Can you do this on small robots? One robot we think about is, can we do this for four wheel robot uh, not, without steering mechanism? This is a skid steered robot platform, independent four wheel drive, no steering mechanism, uh, but you have, we have uh, customized the one kilohertz control frequency we're trying to see if we can get this vehicle running off-road uh, with high agility and do 20 miles per hour. Uh, can we do this? Well, of course, the challenging part is kinematical modeling of this thing is pretty difficult. In fact, you have to model the five body differently. But the sensor perception side is also very important because you have to know the vehicle status because you cannot read the steering angle. There's no such a thing exists. So we have to use four-wheel encoders. We monitor the speed differential between these four, four wheels to estimate the skip on each wheel. In fact, at the end, not only we can control this vehicle, uh, we fuse the multiple sensor from IMU, four wheel encoder, all this minimum, minimum, minimum sensor suite. Well, when we can do trajectory following, we can also determine what kind of terrain we are. Are we on a high friction, carby-like terrain, or it's a low friction, sandy surface? That we can tell that. We can also a, a control our a control parameter based on this so that the minimal uh, sensor fusion. So that is actually kind of become one of the signatures. Uh, what is a minimal sensor you need with a minimal computation power to do things you want to do uh, in the navigation side? So uh, uh, fast forward uh, to 2015, while my PhD student and I was thinking about the problem that we're working on is, well, <sighs> you cannot always rely on GPS signal when you're driving a city. Uh, what if you have a white out snow? What if you have a se uh, severe thunderstorms, decrease your visibility to zero, but you still need a location, right? How do you find where you are? 
and the problem like this is not unique uh, in uh, uh, in Texas. So the thing we were thinking, you know, most time we know where we are citywide. We, I, I know I'm in Austin, I'm, I'm not in San Antonio. That quite clear, right? So that's a prior we can use. Another thing we already have is every vehicle you nowadays have a digital camera, so know your headings. You see that in your vehicle. And plus it has a IMU built in. All the modern vehicles actually all have IMU built in. You probably don't, don't have access to it, but it does have one. So with three information, I tell you that's enough to find out where you are if you just drive on the road for a few seconds. So how we do this? If simply you can monitor your heading change as you drive on the street, you can discretize that into a query data structure. You query your map, and you can find where you are. As long as you don't live in a place like Manhattan area, you can find where you are in five to six turns using our algorithms. So we call that is uh, you know uh, map-based localization is a traditional problem. It's also uh, you know does not depend on any exterior sensor or we call it proprioceptive sensing because only just like uh, you know human data reckoning you don't need to rely on outside sensors so no matter how bad the weather is you can find where you are so that's also a very minimal approach of a sensor fusion so all these three uh, kind of reflect to the principle of the research we've been doing we're using all kinds of sensors so we'll just here I just want to list all these three uh, pieces of work we've done so far at the uh, last but uh, I want to mention our recent effort uh, is uh, we are leading Texas NM team. Actually, prof uh, Professor Gopal Swami is also here. He's also a uh, faculty advisor on this team. Uh, it's our auto drive competition team. What happening, uh, what's, uh, uh, this is the competition organized by General Motors and Society of uh, Automotive Engineers called Auto Drive Challenge. Auto Drive Challenge won the first competition happened from 2000. 17 to 2021, it's a four year competition. Every year you bring your autonomous vehicle to a same competition ground to, to, to compete with other universities. Uh, they're, over, they're like uh, 80 universities applying for this. 80 university was picked by General Motors. Each of us get a donated vehicle. And also uh, we are responsible to de design sen uh, perception system and navigation algorithms on top of that. Then we go to the test ground. In this case, it's a year two test ground. It's the city in the University of Michigan. Eight of us uh, from uh, US and Canada, eight universities, competed here for one week for different things. And so, of course, all the previous lessons we learned start help us to build this navigation algorithm together. But one unique challenge we're facing, as you may know, in year two, we have a group photo on site. And uh, we did a lot of tests and development on the physical vehicle. But what happened is, we don't really have year three, because year three is 2020. Everybody knows what happened in 2020. We are not allowed to touch our vehicle. And in that year, we're kind of in a, in a you know, unsettling status. So how are we gonna do autonomous vehicle research without touching the vehicle? And uh, then that part, especially for perception, we need the real data, not just open data set, because we know we need the data for a specific time, uh, specific location, and all the sets that uh, may not be covered by the open data set. So we were thinking, what can we do to address this problem? Of course, I also we all know we have to do things over Zoom. We don't. This is our group photo at a time. We can only crop copying the like, uh, Zoom photo together. And uh, in fact, what do we try this year? I think it's quite interesting. Is we also thank for. Uh, the software from the Masterworks is one of the sponsors in the, in the process, right before the pandemic, they start developing uh, a software, uh, uh, new features for MATLAB Simulink that can be linked to two things. One is a Unreal Engine, do the real thing rendering. The other is directly linked to the raw stacks. So what happens is our, all the stacks on the software, on the vehicle, are raw stacks can be tested in closed loop in the simulated environment. For the first time, we can do that from perception all the way to vehicle control, the full loops. In fact, we only had two weeks of vehicle time in year four to adjust the parameters for the real vehicle. And we did use that platform and testing. What happens, I'll give you an example here. This vehicle is approaching a traffic light and it's able to detect it and say, hey, this is nothing. When anybody learned in deep learning class would uh, know how to do this. Yes, that's no trivial. But what the underlying signal behind is, we did a 
for loop. This similar environment generates synthetic perception data streams. That including synthetic camera image, I can choose uh, you know, different lighting conditions. I, I can change that. I they also generate lighter data using the particular brand of uh, Velodyne model you are using, how many lines you want to generate. You can also generate the uh, uh, minimal wave radar. Uh, so we can use that as well if your algorithm uses it. Actually, our algorithm uses that as well. So you might say, hey, you can use this train to mix with real data to train your, uh, your algorithms. But what's the real implication behind this is this enable us to test on, on the scenarios we'll never be able to do before, like create accidents, create abnormalities. Because one of the problem we had in the research is we always had the normal driving condition. We don't have exceptions. And this allows us to do that. So I'm, I'm going to stop here. Um, but at the end, we were able to win the championship of this four-year competition. So we're very proud of our team. So that's kind of uh, close my talk today. All right, thank you. So our next speaker is Professor Weibe von Helker from Rice.
Any questions? Got a little bit of time. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. All right. Uh, our next speaker is an assistant professor of computer engineering at UT Awesome, Professor Sandeep Chunchali. So um, thanks for the um, invite to be here. My name is Sandeep. I'm a new assistant professor in the EC department at UT. And my work is broadly on networked and cloud robotics. So in other words, how can resource constrained robots such as low power drones augment their real time computer vision capabilities as well as distributed learning capabilities using 5G wireless networks. So today we're starting to see fleets of networked robots uh, ranging from low power drones to this Amazon Kiva manufacturing robot in orange. And we're starting to place very high hopes and demands on these robots, right? So ideally they should be cheap. At the same time, they should also be compute memory and power efficient. But finally, they should also be highly autonomous and resilient in the physical world. But this is somewhat at odds with the way we're building ML systems today. So we're building computer vision and natural language processing models with millions to billions of parameters. They often require power hungry GPUs to run for real time inference, but they also require quite a lot of labeled human data and cloud computing time to actually train these models. So in other words, they're highly accurate, but at the same time, they're very compute power and data hungry. So this trend is actually starting to become very untenable for the most resource constrained robots. So the key question that motivates my research is how do we actually scale? So can we actually build swarms that are compute memory and power efficient, but also gracefully augment their computation using offboard computation? So if you return to this question of how to scale robots, if you look at the software industry, so software applications have scaled very well using cloud or centralized computing resources. So a natural question to ask is whether robots can also benefit. So one uh, benefit could be if you have a low power drone and you're uncertain, you can augment your perception in real time. So in a 5G wireless network, you can offload perception to maybe a nearby cell tower that has a better GPU. But these benefits actually help robots that are not necessarily computer power constrained. So Intel estimates that a self-driving car will measure about four terabytes of rich sensory data in an hour and a half. So you can continually learn from this rich data stream by statistically sampling rare or out of distribution data. So despite the benefits of the cloud, there are actually understated costs that we typically have today in robotics, right? So our wireless links have intermittent connectivity. Their throughput and latency varies across space and time, but also their economic costs. How much do I store? How much do I label? How much do I, uh, am I willing to spend on training? But there's also real-time delay. There's delay from communication as well as invoking larger models at a centralized server. So given these benefits, but also these end-to-end -end systems costs, most of my research is on building robot cloud collaboration algorithms that are decision theoretic and they're somewhat economic in nature. So robots should estimate the marginal accuracy gain of using network computation and gracefully trade that off with systems costs. So we work on fleet learning, dynamically selecting between local and cloud computation, and also how to represent data. So for those of you on Zoom today, we're using standard video uh, protocols. So every pixel essentially matters the same. But a lot of the video in the future might actually directly be consumed by mapping models or deep neural networks. 
So we have an opportunity to send much less over the air and still get the same sensing task accuracy. So I'll just preview some of the work we've been doing. So collaborative fleet learning. So we've tested this on gigabytes to terabytes of data, some of my commute data as a grad student every day at Stanford, but also with collaborators in Cornell. So an autonomous vehicle might see a well understood freeway scene or a dynamic construction site or a rare event like a self driving car being tested on the road. So this isn't a stock image. This is actually from my dash cam. So today you just upload store and label all this data typically and it's very expensive to do so. But the benefit is you can quantize and compress these neural networks to run on low power devices. So this USB stick here has about eight megabytes of memory. It's a low power edge tensor processing unit and it consumes about three watts of power, whereas a small cloud GPU would be 200 watts. So some of my work is actually building intelligent sampling algorithms that essentially act as data driven filters. So they learn to reject these well understood scenes and just harvest interesting training examples to balance accuracy benefits, but also these end to end systems costs. And some of our work is uh, looking at real time perception. So let's say you can crowdsource interesting data from a fleet. You can train large models optimized for the cloud or small models that can run on your microcontroller. So we're building selection algorithms in gray that are essentially Markov decision processes. So given a sequence of video and past history of the robot, can I decide at every time point whether I should use a fast responsive local compute model on the left, or only if I'm highly uncertain, should I use a larger model that's slower but can localize far off objects? So we actually solve this MDP approximately as an RL agent, and we deploy it with minimal overhead on GPUs. So some of our recent work is now looking at the representation of this data that we offload for video, both for learning and real time perception. So this is a recent paper published in RSS. So let's say your robot sees a sensory data X, you encode to Z. Typically, you would send it over a wireless link and decode to X hat, assuming that the fundamental consumer is a human. So every pixel matters the same. That's how information theory and rate distortion theory works today. But if the consumer is a deep network, if you look at the sensitivity of the ultimate task accuracy with respect to pixel distortions, you can use that as feedback to co-design a neural compression scheme. So we actually tested this on low power accelerators. You can see some of the plots on the right. So the Y axis is task loss, so lower is better. And the X axis is how much data I share. So red are standard video codecs, which take more data, but get lower accuracy, whereas our schemes are in blue and orange. So they're more data efficient, but do not sacrifice on accuracy. So some of our recent work is actually not quite in robotics, but pushing this idea of learning representations to network control systems. So this is a paper in Europe this year. It's actually inspired by some work I did in industry at a startup that's now part of VMware. So let's take AT&T in Austin. They sell congestion forecasts are gigabytes of data in real time per day. So let's say AT&T gets a high volume time series S and they want to share the cell congestion forecast to Uber. So maybe Uber can better route its cars across the city. So I would take this large time series S, I would encode it using learnable parameters theta E and send it across the data boundary that limits how much data I share, but also privacy regulations. But then the ultimate consumer is a control authority, say Uber. So today I would just decode to minimize mean forecasting error. So every feature of this time series roughly matters the same. But if your ultimate consumer is model based control, so this is a differentiable model predictive controller about how to route your cars, then the ultimate objective is your task cost. So if you take the gradient of the cost with respect to the input, you can guide your uh, lossy compression schemes, but also prioritize which features matter the most and how do I actually price them. So we've actually looked at this same framework and how we can synthesize adversarial scenarios for perception in robotics. So we've actually used this kind of framework uh, sensitivity analysis to drones, for example. So I'll just finish up by some applications. So in a future smart city, you might have Tesla's or autonomous vehicles that generate huge amounts of driving logs. 
And you might have some delay tolerance about when you send them across the city. So ideally, if you have a forecast of cell demand, you should update your maps only when it doesn't degrade real-time traffic, such as voice and zoom. So we're actually using these model predictive control techniques to schedule traffic. So this is some data that we did with this network operator in Australia called Telstra. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude. So there's a lot of buzz about representation learning in robotics, but turns out it can also help us decide how to communicate between robots and network servers. Thanks. Our next speaker is a professor of mechanical engineering from Rice University, Professor Marcio, Marcio Malley. Thank you again to the organizers. This has been great. Um, good to see everybody in four dimensions, right? Not just little boxes. Um, so um, most of you who are aware of my work uh, know about my work because of my collaborations with Ashish, uh, which are sadly on a small hiatus, but we're going to get back together. Um, so I'm not going to talk about this today, but I did want to make you aware if you're interested, um, we are still actively working in the area of exoskeletal robots for upper limb rehabilitation. We um, design robotic devices, we develop the control algorithms, we also do uh, human intent detection, and then all the way to sort of early stage clinical translation in um, impairments like spinal cord injury and stroke. Um, what you may not know is like the other half of my lab, which is haptics. So I'm a haptics person. I started in the field of haptics over 20 years ago. Um, and I'm just really fascinated by the sense of touch, right? I think touch is really the most fascinating sense because unlike vision or audition, it's bi-directional. No matter how long you look at me, you can't make me speak faster. No matter how long you listen to me, you can't make me slow down and speak more clearly. Right, you have no ability to affect through the sense of vision or the sense of hearing. But through touch, you're manipulating the environment. You're exploring and, um, uh, and inducing the receptors in your skin to have this uh, neural response that you would then interpret as textures, as squishiness, as temperature. Um, and this really uh, is a great playground for a mechanical engineer to, to think about how we can recreate that sense of touch for human users. So, um, and, and what's, what's really interesting about touch is it's distributed over our whole body, right? Skin is the largest sensory organ uh, that we have. And within the skin are a huge range of different types of sensors. So we're doing sensor fusion uh, every day. The ones that are most interesting to me are the Meisner corpuscles. We use these to uh, sense slip or to control our grasp. The Merkel disc receptors, this helps us sense pressure, form, texture, and edges. Pachinian corpuscles help us sense vibration and rust, roughness, and the Raffini endings are the sensors in our skin that tell us about uh, lateral forces or shear of the skin across, uh, across the, the surface of the, of the body. So we have all of these different kinds of touch receptor, receptors. So if we wanna recreate the sense of touch for humans, we need to think about what are the appropriate devices and which are the right cues that we want to convey back to them. So, um, now taking this to the area that I've been working in in the past few years, this is wearable robotics, wearable haptic devices for communication between humans, robots, and agents. So uh, maybe you've got a Roomba at home and you really wish that you could have a real-time notification that its battery is dying or that it's stuck in a corner. Uh, perhaps you're trying to navigate the uh, rush hour traffic in Austin and you don't want to visually attend to your navigation system, you would like some haptic cues that tell you when your turn is coming up or if there's a slowdown in traffic. Or maybe we want to add that haptic sense to our Zoom calls so that we can communicate uh, social touch as well. So for me, the challenge in all these applications is what is the information that we want to encode? So what's important about that status of the robot or the human interaction or the, the virtual environment that I want to convey back to the user among this set of different touch experiences that I can provide? And then what's the right device to do that? Again, coming at this as a mechanical engineer. So I'm going to just highlight a few of the different projects that we've been doing in the lab, from the very simple to the more com complex systems. So this is one of our first forays into wearable haptics. So this is a transradio amputee. She's using an EMG control prosthesis. Uh, with, that pros with that prosthesis, she's controlling the, the pose of the hand. And we're measuring the pose of the hand through an encoder in the system. And we're mapping that to a haptic rocker that's, get, that's shearing the skin back and forth. So the amount of closure of the hand is mapped to a degree of skin stretch, and she's able to use that information so she doesn't have to visually attend to the pose of the, robot, of the prosthesis for every task that she's doing. 
Um, the success of this was moderate. She really liked it. Uh, we weren't able to show that that haptic cue itself was useful for this task. And I think that speaks to the challenges of what is the key piece of information that we want to measure and translate back to the human operator. In this case, it's a very um, intuitive thing, posed to uh, stretch. Um, and so in some of our applications, it's a little less of a straightforward mapping. Um, we've been working for a, actually a good bit of time with Houston Methodist on endovascular surgical skill training. We're interested in using haptics to provide real-time performance feedback to the surgeon. The way that training works right now in endovascular surgery is that a resident stands at a physical model or a VR simulator, and over their shoulder is an expert who is studying what they're doing. Right, so here the trainee is inserting flexible guide wire and catheter through a sheath into a plastic physical model that's anatomically inspired. They're visualizing the 3D anatomy with this real-time fluoroscopy image, and the expert is standing over their shoulder with a checklist that looks just like a, you know, the same kind of feedback that you might get from the conference organizers here on a scale of one to ten. How great was this experience? Right? So um, it's useful, but it's subjective. And it really depends on what are the metrics that you've chosen to assess. It also takes an expert to do this assessment. So our collaborators were really interested in finding a way to do objective assessment of skill. And then the stretch goal being now can we provide that assessment in real time to see how it might affect performance. So I'm going to fast forward over about three PhDs and tell you what we're doing now. Uh, we had a really great success in showing that the kinematic measures of the tooltip movement smoothness, so the, the smoothness of the tip of the guide wire and the catheter, correlated to, to expertise. And not just enough to differentiate our graduate students from expert surgeons, but to differenti differentiate between residents, fellows, and attending surgeons. So really fine-grained assessment of skill. So now that we can do that, we're mapping to a real-time feedback environment. So our, uh, our trainees now work, uh, we've gone from a box to a mannequin, same task, they're inserting flexible guide wires and catheters into this mannequin. We're uh, performing navigation tasks to different targets in that anatomy. We're tracking in real time the tooltip trajectories, and from that, assessing performance in real time based on the smoothness of the tooltip movements. We then map that score to a very simple haptic cue. We're using a vibrotactor worn on the arm, Right? Surgery itself is really um, cluttered with visual feedback and auditory feedback in the OR. They wanted a haptic cue. And so it's basically very simple. Three annoying buzzes if your movements are really jerky. Two moderately annoying buzzes if your movements are OK. And one refreshing, smooth little buzz to tell you you're doing a good job. We give this feedback every 10 to 15 seconds, depending on the length of the task. We've shown in non-surgical tasks that this changes folks' strategy and how they perform tasks. They become faster without loss of accuracy with this kind of feedback about their movement smoothness. We're providing this feedback in a wearable device that's embedded with linear resonant actuators. This is open source um, hardware and software that you can find on our website, syntax.org, if you're interested in um, producing your own wearable haptic feedback devices that do vibration. All right, two minutes for two more quick projects. We had a fun project with Facebook now getting a little more complicated with our wearable devices and the different haptic cues that we're providing. Here we wanted to take combination multi-sensory haptic cues that include stretch, squeeze, and vibration, and encode phonemes, or the parts of speech. So just as you're driving home, you could get a text message, and instead of having to look at your wrist, you could feel a sequence of haptic cues that map to the phonemes in the phrase, can you pick up dinner? You'd be trained on this phrase, and then you get the message, and, uh, and go pick up your ramen noodles and, uh, and bring them home. Hi. Right. So the challenges in this particular task were that there were two aspects to haptic communication. First, you have to reliably perceive the haptic cues. And second, you have to learn the mapping of those cues to the information. We went through a series of psychophysical evaluations to show that people could do that identification. They could feel these multisensory cues and correctly identify the components. And then we could teach them through a GUI training interface how to, map those, um, how to map those cues to the phonemes and put words together. With 100 minutes of training, they had word recall accuracy from our vocabulary of over 90%. All right, last bit, because this is cool videos. Uh, I really want to get to uh, how we can feel objects that don't physically exist. So we're taking an approach called referred haptic feedback, providing haptic feedback on the wrist that would normally be felt at the fingertips. We want to avoid simple, low-fidelity hand controllers and complex, bulky haptic gloves and do something in the middle. 
So we have a device called TASBI that incorporates uh, six fiber tactors and a really cool uh, brushless DC motor pulley mechanism to just squeeze around the wrist. There's the squeeze. There, it is in action, right? So squeezing, uh, it's about the size of a smartwatch. And the magic is in the, uh, how we put it all together. So as you're interacting with objects in the virtual environment, we're using either the controller for hand tracking or the head mounted display for tracking. We're giving you a small vibration cue upon contact. As you depress the button, you get a continuous squeeze cue proportional to the stiffness of the button that we want you to feel. And then we can overlay that with pseudo, visual pseudo haptics, which is showing you that your virtual hand is in a different location than your physical hand. And that mismatch we can use to play with the sense of effort that you feel that you're uh, ex um, extending to, to ex uh, experience the task. I'd be happy to talk about this more with you uh, at the next break. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. Uh, last but not least, our final speaker uh, is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at UT Austin, uh, Farshid, Professor Farshid Alambegi. Hello, everyone. So I'm Farshid Alambegi, an assistant professor in UT Austin. So I started my job in 2019. My reference is COVID, so one semester before COVID. So I had two years of challenging time during the COVID, but thanks to my students, we could do cool, basically, work that I'm going to show you. So the topic today I'm going to talk about is robotic engineering of spinal fixation procedures. So here's my lab. So a few months ago, we had like a fancy team video recorders from UT came to my lab, made this nice video of my lab and Dr. Ann Foy. I guess she's not here. So we are the two faculty doing uh, basically surgical robotics in UT, Texas Robotics. So my lab name is Advanced Robotic Technologies for Surgery. We call it ART in short. And the goal here is that uh, we are going to use the name surgery engineering or engineering of a surgery. The meaning is that actually so far, most of the work done in robotic surgery or like from the engineering perspective is that surgeons coming to us saying, okay, here is the need, make something for us, but it's not going to work. So with surgery engineering, we are going to work together along the path to make something, some technology from hardware to software that we see the need in the end and then back design it in order to have something to be useful. So with that, I wanna start with this nice plot I always show it in my talks that x-axis are the uh, important years in terms of milestones in development of different technologies in surgery. It starts with actually open surgery, so the tools that they develop to do surgery on uh, patients. In open surgery, what happens, surgeons going in might like make a very large incisions. The good thing is that uh, in this way, surgeons have direct access. They can see anatomy. It makes it very easy for them. But patients are not happy with this regard because it takes time for them to get better and then recover. So, then they started to talk about minimally invasive surgery. What happens instead of having large incisions, now they have a small holes, like uh, up to one centimeter, two to, three, two to three holes. Instead of having a direct access for surgeons, they have small holes, tools going inside, and then surgeons trying to do surgery. In this regard, actually, surgeons are not happy because they have lost the direct access to see the anatomy and then manipulate the tissue. But from patients' perspective, they are very happy because the recovery time is much faster. So uh, about 1990, like intuitive surgical came in and introduced the robot uh, uh, Da Vinci. You might have heard the name. So the cool thing was that the idea was that make surgeons and patients both happy because what happens, they have a very nice console. They can sit behind, they have a 3D view and they are doing minimally invasive surgery. So no large incisions, very nice and comfortable actually platform or robotic. So, uh, currently, there are actually a lot of surgeries uh, performed using this device. So this is old. This is up to 2000. Now, after 20 years, we have different versions of actually intuitive surgical Da Vinci robot, and they have another product actually in the market called Ion. Top right, you see their, their uh, single port uh, intuitive surgical Da Vinci robot in which you see instead of using rigid tools, you have one port, you have a snake-like robot coming in, you have one endoscope which is flexible, so you have more dexterity to do the, basically the task. So the last two elements here, milestones, are basically, this is the topic of research mainly for the last 10, 15 years, is developing tools 
and instruments and robots that are flexible instead of being rigid. So talks about natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery or no surgery in short, no incision going through the natural orifices like mouse or uh, creating more dexterity flexibility while they are uh, basically going through a minimal invasive procedure. So instead of rigid tools that you can just pivot through the entry point, now you have dexterous tools, flexible tools that they can actuate. They are like a snake-like. So we call them continuum robots or like basically uh, robots that have infinite degree of freedom. So most of the time they are uh, cable driven, actuated with some uh, indirect actuation mechanism. So since you want to make the robot fully flexible, you cannot put motors there. So, so the anatomy should be flexible. So one cool mechanism would be cables. So on the bottom right, you see another company actually acquired by Johnson & Johnson in 2020 named Oris. They have made this robotic catheteric system to go through the lung, like to one millimeter area inside the lung can do biopsy. Before then, that, no surgeon could do it. So, but if you check here, if you check all the literature and industry, most of these flexible tools have been developed for soft tissue interventions mainly. And it's like uh, somehow obvious because these robots are flexible as soon as they interact, basically uh, they are flexible the body because they wanna create like safe interaction between the robot and environment. But you can't see flexible robots that are being used in orthopedics. And the reason is critical and it's like very obvious because you're using a flexible tool on hard tissue. As soon as they touch, they might buckle and then they don't do what they want. So that's a gap over there. Another milestone that you are working, all of you are talking through the day about autonomy, but that's industrial robotics. But in surgery, what we see in 20, 30 year, we can share part of the task with the surgeon. So semi-autonomous or shared autonomy, that's a topic that we are talking about. But the challenge is that, uh, before talking about challenges, if you're talking about hard tissue on top right, 1990, this is the robo, uh, RoboDoc robot, very first surgical robot built in the world. They have done this on total knee surgery. And it's obvious, it's totally machining, right? You can take MRI, CT scan, you can plan, it's like pretty much command the robot, go and cut. But if you're talking about the deformable tissue, it's super challenging, right, inside the body. You are talking about the tissue and environment. As soon as you touch, it might deform in a way that makes it very, very challenging. So autonomy on hard tissue is easy, but on soft tissue, super challenging. So we bring it to this nice table or graph that I made. X-axis is dexterity, Y-axis is the autonomy. So hard tissue related surgery, they are very easy in terms of autonomy. In terms of dexterity, super challenging. So lower uh, top left, basically quadrant. Bottom right is soft tissue related surgery. We have a lot of actually robots, even like commercialized, but in terms of autonomy, they are super challenging. But ideally, you wanna be on top right quadrant. So having robots and algorithms to be implemented on soft and hard tissue surgeries and being robust. So that's the area that my lab, hopefully, we are focusing on. So to do that, we need to develop flexible robots, even sensors and algorithms to be used on both hard tissue and soft tissue related surgery. So today I wanna to talk about one of the actually projects uh, luckily funded by NIH, which is building this uh, image guided robot assisted procedure for neurosurgical application. You can see here we have a robotic arm positioning a flexible robot or continuum robot. We call it a steerable drilling robot because instead of just getting in straight trajectory, like all the drills that you have seen, we can control it to go through curved trajectories. It provides a lot of actually benefits for the surgeons because you can avoid anatomy, you can drill in a specific trajectory, so on and so forth. But the challenge is that if you are talking about a flexible robot, you need to be able to track it in a minimally invasive way. So we are also developing flexible optical shape sensors that you can put to our robot and see them through the process to make sure that they are following the commands that we are giving to them. And the most important part of this project is developing also flexible implants. So for the projects that we have, we wanted to treat and improve a spinal fixation on osteoporotic patients. And for osteoporotic patients, what happens, their bone doesn't have the density of healthy patients. And what happens if you have an, a screw, like typical screws that they are using in various spinal application, they implant the screw into the bone to uh, basically lock two, three levels of vertebrae. But what happens? 
because their bones are osteoporotic, after some times, they are calling it pull out or loosening, and they, they need to go another intervention, so it's super hard and challenging. In which, what we suggested, we said, okay, let's take quantitative CT scans of a patient. Quantitative means that you can map the bone density in 3D. So we run point element analysis, we find the regions in the bone which has higher density, and we say, instead of just using rigid screws, that you are limited with the anatomy of the basically spine, basically this line, you can curve into literally any place inside the uh, basically vertebra, drill it with a steerable drilling robot, and then put a flexible implant too. So that's the whole concept. So pretty much this project has biomechanics, science element, design of new flexible implant, and also a steerable drilling robot. So it starts with actually very, very mathematical model. So I don't want to get into that, but continuum robots and soft robotics to design a good robot to be able to work. We call it holistic design, meaning that we need to consider at the very first step everything, even if you want to control it from the biocompatibility and everything, considering the modeling. So we have developed with this like general model to make sure that we can make robots that's working. So we had four papers on it. I'm going to skip that, but I want to show you this nice video that actually can be used in soft robotics as well, showing what's the feature of our model is that we can completely model the tension loss and effect of friction, which is critical when you have a cable inside your robot. Super challenging, but pretty much we have modeled it and then evaluated with experiments. Coming back to the definition of problem, what happens in osteoporosis or spinal fixation, they use this rigid screw. But look at here, we try to somehow mark osteoporotic region with different colors with like a, a, a high density part of the bone. So you are limited with these straight trajectories. If you are limited and if you have osteoporotic region, no matter what, sooner or later, this screw and fixation is going to fail. So, and you have a screw loosening and pull out. So to address that, we said, let's just design a robot that can curve in and then create a curve trajectory, drilling curve trajectories. So pretty much we have built this robot. So I'm going to show you a few of videos of the experiment. So we, this is a simulated bone material. We can drill in curved trajectory. This is a thermal camera actually showing because we wanted to see what's happening through the drilling. And here is the, I want to just for the sake of time, just skip that. So this is our drilling live. And then this is actually through the drilling. This thermal camera, since during cutting, we generate heat, we can show actually what's happening into that was by the time we didn't we didn't have uh, we hadn't bought our x-ray machine to see through so very first experiment so here are some results showing that very reliably reasonable amount of time because if you make something you hand it into the surgeons you want to make sure that they are going to use it if it takes forever they just throw it out they are not going to use it so it's pretty much the same time of cutting here is actually a nice video. Not only we can just drill in one trajectory, we call it like branch cutting. In a minimal invasive surgery, it's very important to get in from one hole and then try to minimize and do not compromise healthy bone. So we get into uh, one basic entry point and you can curve out to different trajectories. So this video shows different channels. We just passed in an endoscope to see actually what's the quality of the cuts. We did it and here is actually after buying our fancy X-ray machine here, See, we, got, uh, we bought some animal bones. We wanted to test that it's working actually on animal bones. Pretty much we showed that. But then after than that, we said, okay, flexible screws. For the first time, we wanted to make some flexible implants. The challenge was that, okay, what should it be look like? So we made this half rigid, half flexible implant all through like additive manufacturing using like a stainless steel. It's quite compatible. We uh, designed two different versions, but the challenge is that we wanted to know. So you want to have the strengths, you want to have flexibility too. So these are contradictory. So we made different versions and then we tested under our x-ray. So we created that drill tunnel inside and we wanted to see if you put it inside the bone, can it create the taps, the, basically the drill tunnel, also can it morph inside. Pretty much we could do it. And this nice video actually shows, we put a tiny, we wanted to see what happens through the tapping. We had a tiny endoscope inside our uh, cannulated like a screw. We wanted to see actually what's the quality of the tapping, can it morph inside, so we put this tiny camera and then, and you see actually in the end I wanna show it to you, so to show that we completely can get into 
you see that we are waving to the camera from the other side to say that actually this is actually completed and I know that we can. Let me see, I can show you because that's fine. Uh, almost there. You see Sheila, my student over there, inside here, not there, and then she's waving to the camera. Anyways, let me get, that's it please. You see, that's us doing this to the camera, say that actually passed it. Thank you so much, thanks to the sponsors, and thanks to my students. <laughs> We're happy to answer questions. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you so much. To, and to any of the speakers, uh, are there any questions that anyone would like to have? We've got time for maybe one or two questions. Right. If not, going once, going twice, right. thrice. Oh. Uh, okay. um, I will back as fast as Sounds good. Um, That's a very good question. So we just finished building this. So that's the next plan that Yoshi is working on. We have done actually some experiments to see the flexibility and model the stiffness. So we have built that point element analysis. We have verified it to see, basically the uh, goal here is to, to design the screw based on the density of the patient because we have a patient specific, uh, like basically framework. You wanna do that so we have built that point element model. We have verified it, but next step is to put into a curve trajectory and add load to see what's the strength that we are carrying here. Very nice. Sure. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it over to Yuka and Joydeep. All right, folks, that concludes all the talks and uh, thanks for all the amazing talks and discussions. I really see the vibrant discussion conversation. That's the whole point of having terrorists today. All right, so just uh, some quick remarks and to just wrap this up. Uh, one is, um, so for this event, and uh, actually in addition to the co-organizers, uh, Jardeep and uh, Michelle, Ethan and uh, Josh, and there's actually a group of volunteers helping us behind the scenes. Some of them are in this room, some of them are outside still working. So let's just give them a, a round of applause and just thank them for making sure this event runs smoothly. Um, of course, and our um, sponsor, Quincer, has been helping us, like really kind of means a lot. Uh, it's like the first time we have this event. Um, and, and uh, if you want to see that. Yeah, so uh, never mind that it says 3.30 p.m. We know things got pushed back by half an hour. We're going to have tours uh, going to Anahe's gym. Uh, it's going to be a five-minute walk. Uh, Josh here is going to be leading this. So if you're interested in the tour, we'll go from there. But before you go, we have a very important announcement. Uh, as a first Terrace event, we'd love to capture this for posterity. So we're going to take a group photograph of everybody here. We're going to go out in the atrium and we're going to take a photograph up from the balcony. Okay. So uh, let's assemble there. Okay. Mitch, you have uh, something to add? Uh, yes. I believe we're going to start from the North Wing uh, gym. We're going to go to the South Wing gym. We're going to go down the stairs to RPL and then we'll go through the, uh, the rapid pro uh, fabrication facilities. Awesome. Uh, oh. Come hang out. It'll be fun to work. Yeah, you are going to see all the amazing robots we show in the slides, right? So those are real ones, like a leg robots, arms, and the surgical robots. Very cool tours to attend. Uh, so that concludes Terrors uh, for this year. And uh, I saw that. Uh, thanks for all the feedback. And uh, I'm going to. Uh, I saw like a lot of excitement. And uh, I'm going to uh, follow up with some of you on maybe the future hosting of terrors and i think uh, just like peter said at the beginning that we are well have the intention to make this really a texas tradition so not just a one-off event so um thanks for being here and i know some of you are hardly heading back today if so have a nice trip and uh, some of you are sticking around for the weekend and enjoy austin the amazing city so i hope you have fun so and um, hopefully we can see you in terrace next year yep looking forward to co-organizing uh, terrace 2023